Well, since it is Mother's Day, I'm going to open up with some humorous uh, responses of how several elementary students answered the following questions about moms. First question was, why did God make mothers? She's the only one who knows where the scotch tape is. And mostly to clean the house. How did God make mothers? Well, he used dirt, just like the rest of us. Magic, plus lots of superpowers, and a lot of stirring. God made my mom just the same as he made me. He just used bigger parts. And one last one here to tie into our passage here this morning in Colossians is Sunday school teacher asked a little boy, Johnny, tell me, frankly, do you say your prayers before you eat? Johnny sat for a moment silently and then answered, I don't have to. My mom is a good cook. <laughs> Well, most Christians are quick to acknowledge the importance of prayer. More specifically, uh, most agree that we should faithfully pray for one another and, and for the church. But while we know we should pray, the question is, do we? How often do we pray for one another and the church? An important follow-up question to that is when we do pray for one another, what is the primary focus of our prayers? What are the things that we focus on most? As we come to verses 9 to 14 here this morning in, in Colossians, we have this opportunity to listen to Paul describe in a way, uh, describe the way that he prays for the Colossians, where, where he prays that they would increase in knowledge, uh, the fruitfulness, strength, and, and give thanks to God their Father. And so as we read the context of this prayer this morning, I pray, uh, my, well, it context of Paul's prayers, it should really encourage us to consider the kind of prayers that, that we pray and evaluate the context, content of our own prayers and for the church and, and for one another. Turn with me to Colossians if you have your Bibles open. And you know what? Let's just read verse 1 right to verse 14 here this morning. I think that's uh, just all going to fit out here perfectly for us. Starting in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel which has come to you as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you. And since the day you heard it and you understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has, he has delivered sorry, us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Let's pray before we continue on here this morning. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you and, 
acknowledging that you are the one, the only true God. That this is your word. And, and so we ask that it would captivate us by the words of Paul to uh, here to, in Colossians to, to cause us to understand it. And then by uh, your spirit, apply it. Because we know that your word is meant for our profit in instruction and in training and correction for being built up in righteousness. And so we ask that you would do a great work in us by your word and your spirit. Through your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we come here to verse 9, let's just read verse 9 here again. It says this, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you, might be, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. What has Paul heard of? Right? Well, we go back to those verses that we just read, right? He, this is like saying, therefore. What is it, therefore? Paul has heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and their love for one another, which comes about because of their sure hope of heaven and a true understanding of God, who he is. What else do we see here? That Paul says, Paul has continued to do what? Pray, right? For Paul, prayer was as natural as breathing. He's, he's consistently, continually praying without ceasing, right? First Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. Uh, praying without ceasing may be complicated for us at times, right? Uh, it might seem unachievable at times, really, but there are times in our lives that, uh, well, we need to continue to pray. And it could be in our speaking to ourselves in our minds, right, and as well throughout the day. But we also know that there are times when we think that we may as well give up in our praying because we haven't seen the results, right? We're result-driven. We want answers. Here's a prayer that was recorded for New Year's, and, and uh, it's quite humorous, but this is how many of us think at times. Prayer goes on to say, Dear God, my prayer for 2024 is for a fat bank account and a thin body. Please don't mix it up like last year. <laughs> right? Answers, unanswered prayers are, are tough. This one obviously is, is humorous, but many are not. And, and so, for example, you may have prayed this in your own lives. I'm just using an illustration here. You may have prayed for your family member, and, and after 10 years, your, your son hasn't turned back to the Lord. Right after eight months, your daughter hasn't been healed. When we look at our church body, during our prayer time, Tuesday mornings, we, we've been praying that God would provide five new families, right? That he would grow us spiritually, that he would look after our needs, both physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, right? We, we know it's all in God's hands. Do we quit praying? Because we haven't seen all the answers that we want to see? No, we pray continuously in the hope that he will provide in all these areas. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. His timing, obviously, is not our timing. His plans are not our plans. Uh, we, we haven't been called to figure out what God is doing. We've been called to pray. What is Paul praying for here? What is he wanting us to do as well? What were they praying for in Colossae? That they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. 
Filled is a key word here. Paul uses it many times in this letter. We see it in verse 19, 25. We see it in chapter 2, and verse 2, verses 9 and 10. Chapter 4, verses 12, 17. Filled. The word carries an idea of being fully equipped. It was used to describe a ship that was ready for a voyage. We bring that into the context of the Christian believer. The believer has in Christ all that he needs in his or her voyage for life or of life. In the New Testament, the word means controlled by. When people, you know, when, as for an example, when people are filled with anger, we see it come out, right? They're controlled by. They, they we are controlled by that anger. That's the negative side. When we flip that over to the positive, to be filled in the spirit, right? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it means to be controlled by the spirit. Paul's prayer then is, is that these, prayer, these believers might be controlled by the full knowledge of God's will. How? Right? That's the next question that comes up. How? By wisdom and spiritual insight through God's word. The Holy Spirit teaches us to submit to him. To be controlled by him. Why, why does Paul pray this? Because the knowledge of God's will is essential for spiritual growth. This is what we're seeking on those Tuesday mornings, throughout the week, Sunday mornings, as a church for spiritual growth. When we become born into the family of God by faith in Jesus Christ, we are born with all that we need for growth and maturity. Then there's the journey, right? Of living that out. This is the theme of Colossians. Colossians chapter two, verse 10 sums it up well. Is saying, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule or authority. Other translations may say complete in him. Or complete in him who is head of all. Right? No other experience is needed in this new birth as a Christian believer. This is key for us as Christians. We're not to, to look for something new. Something out of this world experience right this is where uh, satan comes in to to attack us where he's so he's so good at being deceptive he, he deceives us in thinking that we need something more paul warns the church here to continue to grow in that which they have received at the beginning so when we hear about God's will, and in, in particular, knowing God's will, we normally think of things like, well, should I, should I take that new job, right? Sh should I marry that girl? Should I, where, where should I live, right? Where's the best spot for us, me? What church should I attend? attend? Should I go into ministry, Right? These are all great questions, and yes, they're important in life, but I believe that Paul is seeking or speaking about something bigger, deeper, higher here. Uh, when, we, when looking at his will, God's will in our lives, with, with any given situation, whether it, what, whatever it may be, right, it always must agree with what has already been revealed in his word and so the onus is on excuse me on us as christians to know it and i think this is very important because so easily we, we brush off time and prayer we brush off uh, reading god's word studying his word discipling one another right coming to church whatever it may be and growing in the lord because satan is there to deceive us to get us off the path but we see here paul didn't encourage the colossians to seek uh, visions or wait for voices he prayed that they might get deeper into god's word and thus have a greater wisdom greater insight concerning 
God's will. Paul prays for spiritual wisdom and, un, and the understanding because both wisdom and understanding come through the spirit, uh, through the spirit of God, not through human reasoning. It's through God's word. This is key. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Bible views wisdom as the ability to apply God's will to various life situations. Understanding is the ability to put together facts and, and information, to see the relationships between different things in life, and, and to draw the proper conclusions. Once again, this is not some secret wisdom of the false teachers that was only available to the elite, to, to the few, but rather this is spiritual insight available to all believers, right? Through the Holy Spirit and God's Word. As, as Christians, we should have Scripture, a Bible, right? With us. We, we need to know it, get into it. understand it question is when we're looking at this do we want to have a positive impact on other people's lives and the first thing that we must do is to pray for them the first step is to pray for them to know God's will for us to know God's will and the only way to know that is to get in to God's word. False teacher in, in false teachers in Colossae attracted people through their offer of spiritual knowledge, but they didn't relate this knowledge to life. And so in the Christian life, knowledge and obedience, they, they go together like peanut butter and jam, right? They're inseparable. There's no separation between living and learning. It's simply it's not simply just head knowledge, right? It's also applied, it's lived, it's in the heart. It's who we are. Verse 10 says, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. All Bible truths are practical, not theoretical, right? If we're, if we're growing in knowledge, we should be growing in grace. So our need for knowledge is for a walk, or to, to walk worthy, right? For a worthy walk, a life pleasing to God. Uh, this knowledge of God, His ways, His thoughts, and purpose should lead us, should lead to a result of a changed life within us. So let, let this knowledge of God's Word change your life. Do we know what it means to walk worthy in the Bible? Well, it means daily conduct of one's life, right? Ephesians 2.10 says, God has ordained that his children should walk in good works. The word worthy has, a, has an idea of, of matching up. Our actions should match our words, right? There's an, and our outward presentation should match our inward convictions to walk worthy of our calling means to honor God as we complete his course of action for us the believer who spends time daily in the word and in prayer will know God's will be able to walk with him work for him after all our purpose in life is not to please ourselves but to please the Lord we should walk worthy of our calling worthy of the gospel which means to walk worthy of god that we will walk worthy of god these aren't these aren't works that earn salvations or salvation these are works that demonstrate salvation think of it like this now uh, you're a sports star right you're called up to the big leagues putting on your favorite team jersey right and stepping onto the ice or field court whatever playing 20 percent better than you really are uh, because you're trying to live up to that emblem that name that is on 
the front, right? The crest. And that's precisely what is going on here in Colossians. As, as Christians, we are clothed with Jesus Christ. You are in union with him. You are identified with him and we ought to live worthy of that kind of calling. We ought to get our practice up to where it meets, matches our position, right? Again, it's not earning this position. Rather, it's proving that we belong there by displaying the fruit of the Spirit that lives in us. How we live should match up with what we say we believe. The Bible identifies spiritual fruit as leading people to Christ, praising God, giving money, leaving, living a godly life, displaying holy attributes. This all comes from knowing God's word. Verse 11 says, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience and joy. Right now we're getting somewhere, right? May we all be strengthened with all power. Right? We all like the sounds of this. Oh, well, wait. What was that last part? What are, what are we going to be given power to do? Oh, yeah. For endurance and patience. And I believe this is key uh, because the Christian life, as we know, is hard. Where does this power come from? Take a look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When we look at the word patience, it means endurance, steadfastness, perseverance when circumstances are difficult. Thinking offhand here, I don't, I don't know any Christian in my life or that I've met who hasn't had a difficult life or, or dealing with difficult circumstances or people in their lives, right? It made me think of this past week where, you know, in one way it's comical, but it was frustrating. It, this past week we had to deal with our neighbor taking our cat. Wanting it for his own. The cat got out of our house, disappeared. We thought, well, maybe an animal got her. Right? We don't like dealing with hard things in life. We don't like dealing with hard things in ministry. But patience is an important characteristic of the maturing Christian life. Patience is endurance in action. It's not the Christian sitting in a rocking chair waiting for God to do something. It is the soldier on the battlefield keeping on when the going is tough. Patience is not our normal uh, strong point as a society, right? Uh, we, everything is instant around us. We want it just like that. Oh, a cat. Is showing up into our yard. Oh, I guess we keep it. Nobody's, nobody's looking for it. Well, we'll keep it in our house. Right? Rather than asking around. Well, eventually, that did happen. The Lord provided for us, brought the situation to a peaceful end. And hopefully we can keep our cat inside our house right there there's the action there's a there's an area where we have to grow where we have to learn and so we see this this great need for steadfastness for perseverance that is mentioned here to to not lose our cool in a situation this word means hopeful cheerful endurance Joyful patience. You see Peter mentioning that we should add to our faith where it's translated perseverance in 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 
5 to 7 and says this for this very reason make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue virtue with knowledge knowledge with self-control self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness godliness with brotherly affection brotherly affection with love i find this interesting because it comes right after verse 3 right you go back and what does it say? It says, His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. It's the same principle. Over in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Isn't that amazing? Paul here prayed that the Colossians would experience joyful patience and long suffering, and it's only God's and it's only God's Spirit working within us that can give us that joy. In saying that, I I, uh, I just wanted to add that joy and happy joy and happiness are are two different things. Happen uh, happiness de depends on happenings right if circumstances are are encouraging people are kind we're happy right but joy is independent of both circumstances and people there's this joy in the lord the most joyful epistle paul wrote was philippians and he wrote it from jail with the possibility of being martyred for his faith unbelievable this joy brings forth thankfulness. Christians are filled with the Holy Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit will be joyful, thankful. We're thankful for God's work in our lives in the church, in many ministries, right? We're thankful for the salvation that has been given to us as a gift from Jesus Christ, right? When we lose our joy, we start to begin complaining. We become critical and, and that in, infects the church body, right? And so Paul wants them, he wants us to focus on giving thanks. Giving thanks to whom, right? It's a pretty easy answer, right? Verse 12 says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. There, the more we grow, right, as Christians, the more we should be blown away by what he has done for us. Look, look at what is happening here. He starts off in Colossians with thanking God for what he has done. Now he's praising or praying that the Colossians would thank God too, right? This, this Jesus worthy, God pleasing life is characterized by thanksgiving. As unbelievers in Christ, we were once unqualified for salvation. There was nothing we could do to earn it. Apart from Christ, we would receive Christ's or God's wrath. But he qualified us to receive this amazing inheritance through the finished work on the cross. Right? Who doesn't like an inheritance? Right? Christ here is our inheritance. He is the heir of all things. Scripture tells us he will inherit all things. And yet he has chosen to make us co-heirs with him. And while we wait for his return, we enjoy our share of the spiritual inheritance that we have in him. Isn't that amazing? When we look back to the Old Testament, the people then had an earthly inheritance. The land of Canaan, right? Today we have a spiritual inheritance. Canaan is not a picture of, of heaven. 
for there will be no battles or defeats in heaven. Canaan is a picture of our present inheritance in Christ. We must claim it by faith as we step out on the promises of God. Day by day, we claim our blessings, and this makes us even more thankful to the Lord. Verses 13 and 14 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Christ has delivered us. He's rescued us. He's drawn us to Himself. We were once in the domain of darkness with no light, no hope. But now, in Christ, we are in a whole new kingdom, a kingdom of light, kingdom of hope, kingdom of grace, kingdom of forgiveness, right? The transfer comes by God's power. We are redeemed. We are forgiven in Christ. The experience, or yeah, the experience of Israel in the Old Testament is an illustration of the spiritual experience. For God delivered them from the bondage of Egypt, and he took them into the promised land of their inheritance. God brings us out that he might bring us in. Some of us may fret about whether we are truly forgiven or not. Maybe we think that he's forgiven some of, some of our sins, but is holding on to our worst ones to be brought up again at the judgment seat of Christ. To this I would say with Paul, you have been redeemed. In Christ you have forgiveness you have he has removed your sins as far as the east is from the west it is complete so the question is as we come to the end here is how are we going to finish the race win the prize it's through Christ. How has he purposed that this happens? Go back to the beginning through our prayers. Jesus wants us to constantly pray for one another in Christ in all circumstances that we might, that we together might increasingly see Jesus as our everything through him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for Paul writing to the Colossians and, and to us today and reminding us to seek your will, to allow your Holy Spirit to work in and through us by your word that we may apply it to our daily lives, that our, that our daily walk in the faith would be one that pleases you, pleases your Son. Father, we ask that we would increase in the knowledge of you, to live by your strength, and to always give thanks for our hope in you. Father, may we strive for this in our own lives and also to encourage others to do the same. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.